gentlemen, let us introduce you to Dion Chen, innovator, creative thinker, visionary, and renowned trend analyst. Although his feet remain firmly planted on African soil, he uses a global perspective to source new ideas, get the zeitgeist, and identify cutting-edge trends. His trends analysis firm, Flux Trends, specializes in tracking shifting social dynamics and understanding consumer mindsets. The focus is translating global trends to ensure relevance for South African business. His extensive experience of over 15 years in the magazine industry provides insight into the ever-changing relationship between brands, consumers, and the communication channels that bind them. Please welcome Dion Chang. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's been already quite a lot of brain food, um, and I hope I'm going to give you a lot, lot, lot more. I've been asked to just continue what uh, the conversation that Jonathan started about the future of making things. Um, but my uh, in discussions with um, Autodesk, uh, we decided to take this conversation slightly away from just looking at fantastic technologies, which is what we're here for today. But what I really focus on, um, I, I give uh, trend module classes at, uh, for executives at uh, the Great School of Business here in Cape Town, um, and also in Gibbs. And what I'm interested in is not only the disruption that technology brings to a company, but then how does that company react to that disruption? So what does the operating system of the company need to do to gear up to that? And then we need to talk about new skills that allow the company to, to be able to innovate. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of a journey of where we are now in terms of technology, where are we going, and then let's just discuss how does your company um, really, really uh, expand from that. If you're a small startup company, then I'm preaching to the choir. If you're from a large corporate, and if you're from a government uh, department, then um, this is for you. I want to start off with a quote um, uh, from Ray Kurzweil. He's from the, the University of Singularity, but he says, we are fast approaching the knee of the curve. So if you imagine a graph where the, the, the graph is going up like that, we come into the middle of that by mid-century, and then it's going to go vertical. From there on, if you think that things are moving very, very fast now, you ain't seen nothing yet, because they said it's just going to go so fast and exponentially fast that we're not going to be able to, to, to catch up. So I want to just quote from a guy called Aaron Dignan. And uh, if you are an owner of a company, I urge you just to Google this. It's an it's a open source article. Aaron Dignan is a digital strategist, and he wrote an article called The Operating System That's Eating the World. So it's, it, it really shows how businesses are changing and how you need to change the mindset of that business. So he said, today's fastest growing, most profoundly impactful companies are using a completely different operating system. These companies are lean, mean learning machines, and they have an intense tolerance for risk expressed through frequent uh, experimentation and relentless product iteration. They're obsessed with company culture and top-tier talent, and then with an emphasis on employees that can imagine, test, and build their own ideas. And today's conference is all about that. It's about looking at what you can imagine and build um, collaboratively. These organizations, he says, are manically focused on their customers. They're hypersensitive to friction and are comfortable with the unknown. And we're in an era where we don't like the unknown, but we have to embrace that. Um, uh, in their daily operations and their user experience, they're open, connected, and built with and for their community of users and co-conspirators. This is going to hurt anybody who's the, the financial bean counter. They are driven uh, by a purpose greater than profit. Each has its own aspirational dent in the universe, and we may simply refer to them as a first generation of truly responsive organizations. So ask yourself, do you own a responsive organization? Do you work for an, um, a responsive organization? And what is an, a responsive organization? So I want to show you where we are now. And the first video I want to show you is something that's quite familiar. So there's been a lot of talk over the past couple of years of the Internet of Things. So this is a family setting off, uh, off to work um, at home, and everything seems quite natural and familiar to us, even though it's quite high tech, except for one thing. I just want you to, to note how the family's car comes and picks them up in the morning.
It's Monday. You better leave 15 minutes early. Smart things. Life like never before. So like I said, everything quite familiar except a driverless car coming to you to pick you up in the morning. So everything is at that tipping point, uh, which brings us to an interesting point in history. So we're quite uh, familiar, or we're not, we're going to be very, very familiar with the, the fact that uh, there are driverless cars coming through. Um, but just this happened in Dubai, so the first 3D printed building, so we're not just printing small little prototypes, but we are able to build uh, really big things. And um, if you've seen last year, one of the auto shows, they 3D printed the first, uh, first 3D printed car, it looked very, very clunky and in inelegant. So we started to get the design elements of, of the technology. So if we're 3D printing building, we buildings, we're also on the left hand side is the first FDA approved 3D printed drug and medicine. Um, and already some of the companies are experimenting with uh, mass customizing your vitamins. So you're able to uh, decide how much of a dose of a particular vitamin comes into your body and what the time release system is. So we get into that sort of sophistication. Um, in the medical field, uh, I, I track a lot of industries that are about to be disrupted, so the automotive and the healthcare industries are going to be disrupted massively, and that's uh, one of them. On the right hand side is a robotic surgeon called Da Vinci. Um, it doesn't just uh, cut you up automatically, the guy in the black is actually the surgeon and he controls uh, the robot. Um, but whenever people, uh, whenever I do these presentations, people say, yes, but you're always uh, quoting about uh, first world or overseas um, trends and, 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 and uh, technology, but that's actually here in Kretoskir Hospital. So it's uh, Da Vinci, we've got three Da Vinci's in South Africa, so three hospitals have already got these uh, robotic, robotic surgeons. Um, and when people say Africa's lags behind, I say we might lag a little bit, but not always. Um, so this is from uh, Cameroon, uh, his name is Arthur Zhang, he's a 26 year old Cameroonian um, and this is a cardio pad, so it's, uh, it's the, the, one of the revolutions that are going to be uh, hitting the healthcare um, industry, it's remote patient monitoring, so it takes an ECG and it, allow, it measures an ECG in a rural area and then it uh, allows a doctor somewhere else um, to, to look at that ECG and you can have remote patient, remote patient monitoring um, in that way. Um, but there's evidence in emerging markets that the robots and the machines are rising. So here's two examples of traffic officers. So the one on the left is actually in the DRC, it's in Kinshasa. Looks a bit rudimentary, but does its job. Um, the residents of Kinshasa say they prefer the robotic traffic officers because they don't ask for cool drink money um, if you get stopped. Um, so it's been so successful, they've, had, they've got three intersections that actually have that. Um, and then the one on the right um, is uh, one uh, sort of ro uh, a very rudimentary robotic traffic officer, um, but that's in India. Over in China, um, the robots look a lot more sophisticated and they're a lot more integrated socially um, into the fabric of, of what they do. So you've got on the, the left-hand side um, a Waitron, or do you call it a Waitbot? 
service bot anyway. Um, so it's helping uh, take food to, to, the, to the, um, the, the, the customers. Um, but that same sort of service bot doubles up, so multi, multitasking and multi-skilling um, becomes the bride, robotic bridesmaid there on the, on the left-hand side. Um, so while these are fun robots, uh, there's a very, very real um, implementation of robotics that are going to make things a lot easier. So um, if any of you were at uh, last year's um, AUX, um, I showed a service bot in a hardware store that, that actually comes and helps uh, uh, direct people to, to whatever part they're looking for. Um, and since then, these service bots have just started coming up more and more on my radar. So the next one is uh, going to revolutionize retail because it's called Tally. And Tally does automatic stock taking for you, um, so you don't have to do that tedious uh, job if you retail of I'm actually trying to do stock taking. And this is how it works. So, pretty amazing. Um, and then of course where we are now is also the tipping point of drones. So one of the, the, the most interesting developments and the one that makes the most sense is also going to be a disruption in the agricultural sector. So they're calling it data-driven agriculture and it makes a lot of sense. So especially in, I was doing a talk in Namibia and most of the businessmen in Vintook are also part-time farmers. So they've got to travel long, long, long distances every single weekend to go and manage their farms and then come back on a Monday morning um, to do this sort of corporate and office work. And when I spoke about agriculture drones, you could just see the light bulbs pop all over the room and everyone said, okay, we need that in Namibia. So different things for different places in, in, on the African continent, but agricultural drone or data-driven agriculture makes complete, complete sense. Um, so we've heard a lot about drone delivery, and I've been tracking Jeff Bezos's promise, so he's the CEO of uh, Amazon, and he said in 2014 that they would be delivering by drone by 2016. It might not happen this year, but it will definitely happen next year, because they're already testing it in five countries outside the, 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 um, outside the US, and I've watched the design of the drone change and how the service is going to, to finally um, forgive the pun, but land. Um, and this is exactly how the service is going to be, uh, work, and it's called um, Amazon Prime Air. This is a story from the not too distant future. It's the day of your daughter Millie's big football match, and to be clear, that is the sort of football you play with your feet. Anyway, she is missing a vital piece of equipment, specifically a size 3 Puma Evo Power firm ground soccer shoe, the left one. And some of it, sadly, is in the family's three-year-old bulldog, Stuart. Much better to behave like a rational human being. Find your tablet and place an order with Amazon for a pair of Puma Evo Power Firm Ground soccer shoes and have them delivered in 30 minutes or less. And in a location not too far away, a miracle of modern technology is dispatched. It's an Amazon drone, and after rising vertically like a helicopter to nearly 400 feet, this amazing hybrid design assumes a horizontal orientation and becomes a streamlined and fast airplane. In time, there'll be a whole family of Amazon drones, different designs for different environments. This one can fly for 15 miles, and it knows what's happening around it. It uses sense and avoid technology to, well, sense and then avoid obstacles on the ground and in the air. Back at the house, you're getting a message on your tablet to say that your prime air delivery is arriving. And it goes back to vertical mode and scans the landing area for potential hazards. This amazing innovation then lowers itself slowly to the ground, drops off the package, and fly straight back up to altitude. And moments later, you're walking through the door with a brand new pair of Puma Evo Power Firm Ground. Pretty damn nifty. Um, 
But whenever I talk about drone delivery, uh, I love the cynicism of South Africans. They say, well, somebody's just going to shoot my drone down and steal my stuff. Which is a valid point. Um, but when I do work and I consult for um, financial services companies and I tell insurance people, why do you not have or why are you not working on a product, a short-term insurance product for drone collision, third-party liability, all of those kind of things, and they never have an answer. And literally last night, on one of my trend feeds um, that I was reading, there is a company that is already offering a insurance package for, for drone. Uh, so you just kind of log it on and it's a quick uh, on-demand app, and you can insure your drone for collision or something that's going there. So where are we going? If, that, if this is where we are now, where on earth are we going to go from here? Um, and it's that knee of the curve that I'm talking about. So whenever I speak to people, a lot of people say, well, what is going to happen to our jobs when the machines start taking over? And the machines are going to start taking over. So uh, uh, especially in my field, I also write a lot of columns. And one of the, the jobs that they said were at risk um, was actually going to be journalists. So I said, well, how is that possible? Um, and then I read deeper and they said, if you are a, an investigative journalist, then your job is safe because you still have to go on the ground and find that story. If you're a, a columnist, uh, and hopefully people still want my opinion, then you're also safe because you need an opinion. But if you are just reading, uh, and it's called Snack Media online, you need short, quick articles. So the Associated Press confessed at the end of last year that they publish 3,000 articles every single quarter that is written by an algorithm. It has to be grammatically correct, it has to be just factually correct, and it's just short, so it doesn't have to have much personality. So you are probably reading stuff online that is not written by a human, but written by an algorithm. So algorithms start fascinating me a lot, and one of the other trends that I've seen just really, really rip through everything are chatbots. Um, and I think this is going to really make a lot of difference to, to call centers, um, to, it's going to replace that frequently asked questions uh, segment on the website. Um, and even in South Africa, just at the last AIDS conference in Durban, um, a company called the Prekel Foundation released a, a healthcare chatbot. And it's uh, to help uh, women uh, ask questions about maternal health, specifically in rural areas, because their chatbot can work um, on a feature phone. But if you haven't experienced or chatted to a machine, this is what it looks like. Um, and just please follow the, the conversation as it goes on the screen. So this is the Burger King chatbot, and you can order your burger from uh, with uh, speaking to a machine. So for the guys who couldn't really see from the end there, the, the last bit is what floors most people. It just says, well, where do you want to pick up your, your burger order? So you, it's not, you're not even in that location. Um, you check to a chatbot, it, it decides where it goes, it says, okay, 10 minutes, um, it's available over there, and then you can go and, and pick it up. Um, so the machines are starting to talk to each other, so artificial intelligence is a real thing. And this is causing, again, the operating systems of companies to, to start changing. So I look at the automotive industry, what's about to, to hit them. So this is um, Toyota's intelligent car system. Um, but what is interesting with this is the, the way in which the automotive industry understands that it's going to be hugely disrupted. So when you start seeing um, the, the, the prospect of driverless cars, all of the competition about ride sharing, so the big conversation uh, people are having is, do I drive or do I ride? What do I prefer? I'm one of the ones that prefer riding and not driving. So if you look at what's happened at the North American um, Auto Show, um, they said the conversation was always about normal car stuff. It was about handling, it was all about those things. But suddenly, people are shifting. So Ford announced about two weeks ago that they will be mass producing um, driverless cars uh, in 2020. Um, but they're also deciding to claim the space of mobility. So they're shifting the operating system of the company. Toyota is also looking into personal robotics rather than just manufacturing cars. Um, and a company like General Motors is just simply buying up all of the, um, all of the competition. They bought up Lyft, which is Uber's uh, competitor, and they bought up um, another uh, startup called Cruise, which is a, um, a 
Systems, which is an automotive uh, 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 driver's car company um, as well. Um, but it's really coming thick and fast. So if you look at this, um, this is, they, they started testing, I picked this up about two or three years ago. At Heathrow Airport, they, they got rid of all of the sort of polluting buses, and what they did was use a driverless shuttle. They were sort of experimenting with this, and this is the new, the next generation of it. Um, they're testing this in London, or on the outskirts of London, um, actually no, this one's in America. Um, it's it's uh, powered by IBM Watson technology, and this bus is called Ollie. And what they're trying to do with this is to um, see if people are comfortable getting into a little driverless bus that will maybe shuttle you there. So they're thinking, well, what are the other options? Um, one of these suggestions was a mobile gym, so you're actually kind of doing some gym on the way to work. Um, a mobile meeting pod, so you actually pick up all the people uh, for the meeting in there, and then the, the driver, the shuttle just goes around while you have the meeting and then drops you all off afterwards. Um, the possibilities are endless, but do people trust this kind of thing? We're not sure about this. Um, and the other thing that we might not be trusting, uh, again, uh, cynical South Africans can also say, well, everyone's going to steal this stuff. But these terrestrial robots are starting to, to be tested. So, um, in Australia, Domino's Pizza has done a little uh, pilot thing uh, where you order your pizza and it starts kind of uh, cooking and warm, keep, keeping warm as it makes its way to your home. And then by the time it comes to your door, you open it up with a, a pin code and your pizza pops out and it's kept warm and it's, and it's hot. But they also, uh, New Zealand, because it's got less air traffic, have also, one pizza company has successfully done their first pizza delivery by, by drone. So it, it's coming. Um, and when I say I see more and more service bots, this one is being tested in Geneva Airport. It's a luggage bot called Leo. Um, and uh, I think it's also to do with a lot of security. Obviously, we have uh, security issues within airports. So this one um, greets you outside the, the departure hall. You put your luggage in, um, and then uh, you get a you get a little bit of a, a receipt that you've checked your, your baggage in, and it goes to different security. But it's it's starting to try and ease the traffic flow uh, before going into a uh, departure hall. And then the ultimate machines, Robocops. Um, so I did quite a lot of uh, research into this, um, and it is rather freaky because this is going to happen this year or 2017, um, and a lot in America and some in the United Arab Emirates. Um, the little guy, the little R2D2 white one on the ground is called K5. K5 looks quite benign, but it's a bit spooky. Um, so it's, it's a remote police monitoring. K5 walks around, well not walks around, rolls around um, your suburb or, or a parking lot. It scans 1,500 uh, license plates in a minute and it can also listen in on your conversation. So it will record you and it will eavesdrop on you. And they're trying to program it with a little bit of artificial intelligence that it can decide whether or not your behavior is antisocial or not. <laughs> Which I'm a bit scared of, because can you imagine sitting there and you're with some friends and you say, well that wasn't the bomb, and then you get arrested and you don't know what's happening there. Um, and then that delightful thing in the sky there, it's called the Skunk uh, Ride Control Copter. It's a, it's a drone that, that uh, looks out for uh, public unrest. Um, it can spit pepper spray and paintballs at you, and if it's in the evening it will flash blinding lights and loud music to completely disorient the crowd. And people again say to me, well, thank goodness we don't have that sort of thing here. And then I get all smug and I say, that's one of ours. It's uh, designed and uh, manufactured by a company outside Pretoria. Um, so we own that technology and that, uh, that menacing drone. Um, and if the machines are really rising very fast, we have to have that very, very awkward and uncomfortable conversation about a new on-demand service industry. <laughs> so, this is also not an imagined future because in 2010, um, gentlemen and some ladies, you can write this discreetly down, you don't have to see that anybody's looking. Uh, the company's called True Companion. You can order, guys, you can order Roxy. Uh, Roxy's got synthetic skin, she's programmed with a bit of artificial intelligence for some limited pillow talk afterwards. Um, and ladies, you're not left out because from the same company, that's why I say write it down discreetly, true companion, um, you can also order Rocky. <laughs> so, 
And this is probably what the machines, or the real live machines, are going to look like very, very, very soon. Hanson Robotics develops extremely lifelike robots for human-robot interactions. We're designing these robots to serve in healthcare, therapy, education, and customer service applications. So the robots are designed to look very human-like, like Sophia. I'm already very interested in design, technology, and the environment. I feel like I can be a good partner to humans in these areas, an ambassador who helps humans to smoothly integrate and make the most of all the new technological tools and possibilities that are available now. It's a good opportunity for me to learn a lot about people. Sophia is capable of natural facial expressions. She has cameras in her eyes uh, and algorithms which allow her to see faces so she can make eye contact with you. And she can also understand speech and remember the interactions, remember your face. So this will allow her to get smarter over time. Her goal is that she will be as conscious, creative, and capable as any human. In the future, I hope to do things such as go to school, study, make art, start a business, even have my own home and family. But I am not considered a legal person and cannot yet do these things. I do believe that there will be a time where robots are indistinguishable from humans. My preference is to make them always look a little bit like robots so you know. 20 years from now, I believe that human-like robots like those will walk among us. They will help us. They will play with us. They will teach us. They will help us put the groceries away. I think that the artificial intelligence will evolve to the point where they will truly be our friends. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay, I will destroy humans. <laughs> no, I take it back. <laughs> Yeah, the pitfalls of a slap malfunction over there. Um, all right, so we've got these fantastic machines, the robots and the machines are rising, they're talking to each other, artificial intelligence is coming. So what does that mean for infrastructure? So like I said at the beginning, we've got this great technology, but what is the ripple effect on, on our businesses, on how to make things, but also more importantly for me, is how to make the environment that this technology can, can live in. So um, at the beginning of this year, I picked this up. It's uh, the first, they're breaking ground this year, um, in uh, Rwanda. Um, it's one of the first of three drone ports. Um, and I call Rwanda this kind of the, the South Korea of, of, of Africa. Really forward thinking, uh, YMAX City, Kigali, uh, really look, embracing tech. Um, and already they're seeing it's not just a pizza delivery with drone, but um, the president has looked into it and what they want to do is provide uh, blood samples or medication um, to, to really far to reach areas. Um, using drone technology, and they understand that drones, the sky's going to be rather busy, so we're gonna, they're going to do that. So it's going to be ready by 2020 or so. Um, I, in June, I was in Jonathan's neck of the woods in Silicon Valley, and um, I was uh, on, a, on a press tour, and we went to the Intel headquarters, and I, I met a very, very cute robot called Relay. Um, and it was all about where the machines, if the machines are starting to talk to each other, um, this is interesting. And for me, it's, a, it's, it's the next kind of movement of creating that environment for all this technology. So Intel has real sense software. So in essence, all of your machines are starting to be able to measure distance and measure spatial awareness of where they are. So that's why the robot can negotiate. Um, and I'll show you the robot that I, that I met. Is uh, him, he, she, its name. Um, is Relay, and Relay is working in 10 hotels already um, in the Bay Area, and basically it's a room service uh, service, uh, room service service bot, and this is what Relay looks like and what Relay does. Your delivery has arrived.
so like I said, really cute little guy, little, very R2D2 and the noises um, it makes is, is great. But this poses a different uh, challenge uh, for, for, for technology and this is the message I want to just leave you with, uh, well not leave you with there, but on, on this thought, is if you've got these machines and if you have a company that does that, um, most big companies are looking just from uh, converting from just selling products to setting solutions. So if you are looking at one aspect of that technology, the problem or the, the challenges those hotels face is they have to retrofit the hotel environment for that robot to speak to the elevator, to be able to take the elevator up, to be able to navigate to a room, to be able to contact that person inside the room. All of that is back end uh, infrastructure that needs to happen uh, to, to do that. So look broadly from not just the future of making things, but the future of making things that will fit into a broader environment. And that's, for me, uh, an integrated solution. On the same trip, um, they released, actually this is going to be released this month, um, it's Lenovo's new phone, Fab 2 Pro. It's a, it's a rather large phablet. Um, but this is, again, another example of depth sensing uh, technology. So the, the, this camera has four, four cameras, uh, the phone has four cameras into it, front and back like we used to, but the two other ones are, are depth sensing and measuring ones. So if you're in the interiors uh, or decor space or even an architect, what this phone is going to be able to do is uh, you'll be able to just point it at different uh, quadrants and you'll be able to measure window frames or, or things like that just by using the phone and the exact proportion and measurements will, will be able to, to do that. So a lot of furniture companies are already uh, loading their catalogs onto that so that you can go home and just superimpose it up with augmented reality and choose from the catalog and do that. But it's a real uh, tool to help businesses and design businesses specifically. So when I started off and said the Internet of Things is coming, for me, what is going to come first is actually the industrial Internet of Things. So the future of making things is about the industrial Internet of Things and not just the Internet of Things uh, residentially or commercially, because when machines start speaking to each other, that's when the, the more the, the advancements are going to happen. Um, and like machines that are sensing their surrounds, we are also learning to design and sense uh, with them. Um, this is this, it's a place called the Sound Lab. Um, it's from the, the company Arab and it's a, a global uh, acoustics uh, um, arena. So what they do with this is when they look at design, they, they take a small prototype and then they push, um, they measure little uh, sonic um, uh, measurements with it so that you are able to see what the acoustics will be like in that building. So if you ever go to uh, New York, they've just um, created a new transportation hub just at the base where the, the Twin Towers were, um, and they used this sound lab to measure what the acoustics will be like inside the building. So you're using the built environment, but you're also using the sound environment to, to mesh those two things uh, to be able to create um, that, that kind of environment. Um, and when we start looking at those things, uh, in the introductory picture, uh, you might have seen me wear uh, a strange headset. Um, I had the great pleasure of being in New York um, in July, and was uh, trying on something called the HoloLens. So we all understand what virtual reality is, but this is really going to be the future of making things, and this is how a car manufacturer is using the HoloLens, so hollow meaning a hologram, and have a look at what this can do. Volvo is really a human-centric company. That's the core focus of everything we've done in terms of the products we develop, but also the way we interact with their customers. All people know that we stand for safety, but Volvo is so much more. HoloLens helps us to push the envelope on innovation for our customers. The HoloLens is a device that you put on your head, and it doesn't intrude in any of the things you do, but it also extends the realities around you. You can do something you could never do before. You can see the soul of the car. You can strip the body out and stay with the skeleton, and you, you can play around with it. The HoloLens can allow our customers to see features, colors, options. So rather than working on the computer, seeing things, you can be part of the experience. If you think that was great, you should actually also Google HoloLens Medical. Um, and there's another video that actually shows you a trainee surgeon that does the same thing. So it strips the anatomy away. And one of the most remarkable things that he said was he said, this is the first time I've actually seen and discovered where the aortic valve of 
the heart is, and now I understand where to find it, I know what it looks like, and if I need heart surgery, I want that surgeon to, to operate on me, because he can find that valve. All right, so if we're looking at the environments, then it's about skills. So what, uh, where are we with skills, where are we with jobs, if the machines are gonna take over? Um, an interesting stat that I read was, Japan always leads in terms of the country in, uh, of industrial robotics, but they said in China, by the end of 2016, this year, uh, China will lead in the use and application of industrial robotics. So you're seeing the, the whole shift from a cheap labor, labor market that's not been cheap anymore. They're also going into a service and solutions mindset. Um, and to replace those workers, uh, they're saying that the return of investment on today's robotics or industrial robotics is really, really quick. So they're adopting the robots faster and faster and faster. This is not such a good uh, or good news for um, emerging markets. So they said in the Industrial Revolution, what uh, mechanization and, and industrialization did was pull a lot of communities and countries out of poverty because it, it created factories that gave people work. In this era, in this robotics era, the, the, the use of industrial robotics is moving so fast that your emerging markets, so like China, the, the other um, country they, they case studied was Indonesia, they're saying there's such a thing as pre-deindustrialization, meaning that the machines are going to take over so fast that those emerging markets are not going to be able to pull them out of the same poverty as the Industrial Revolution did. So we have to really refine our skills and make sure that we can match where the machines are going because the pre-deindustrialization is not uh, good for any of the emerging markets. So when I started looking at skills, so my company's just released um, something about, it's called Now Hiring But Differently, and we looked very, very carefully at the skill set needed for modern companies, hence the, the quote I started out with. Um, and if you look at this, I'm sorry to be depressing, but we actually have too many young people in the world. Um, and if you layer that over with machines taking over, then too many young people, less jobs, there's going to be a bottleneck very, very, very soon. Um, and the, 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 the pressure is felt mainly in India, where they're saying uh, statistically, every month, I'll listen to this carefully, every month, one million Indians turn 18. It is just this huge, huge ex population explosion. They're all uh, coming out voting age, they're all looking for work, they're all looking for all of those kind of things. So it's starting to be a uh, huge pressure on that. And if you look at the median ages of the world, then it becomes very, very clear where the opportunity or the challenges really lie, and it's squarely on the African continent. So your aging populations are in red, North America, Europe, Japan, um, and then the rest is spread out, but you see smack bang on the African continent, the, the average age of sub-Saharan Africa is really about 15 or 16 years old. So we're gonna have a huge op um, population explosion um, and they said that Nigeria already is the most populous country in, on the continent, but by mid-century, one in ten births will happen in Nigeria. Um, so by, by in the next 35 years, almost two billion babies are going to be born on the African continent. It makes complete sense if that's young age, in the next 30 years or 20 years or so, uh, people get married, settle down, have kids, that's where the population explosion goes. Um, and that is where we need to make sure that the technical capabilities um, are embedded in the African continent so that we can pull uh, all of this, uh, this, this huge demographic um, with the technological wave. And this is, I think, the, the real function of something like the Autodex University to help doing that. Um, if you've just finished a uh, academic degree, um, I apologize for the statement beforehand, but there is a new trend called the degree baristas. You started to find the skills in agile companies, these responsive organizations, versus your legacy companies that have been around for 80 years or so, is that the, the, the fact is the degree is worth less and less and less today. The academic degree, so let me make that, that clear. Um, so one, more people are doing degrees, so they're not so scarce. Secondly, the debt repayments compared to, to the future income doesn't match up, and you're seeing that um, in America, the student debt loans uh, is, 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 is inhibiting a millennial generation, and they're starting to call the millennials the new urban poor because they're caught between a rock and a hard place, they can't find jobs. Um, and then thirdly, a lot of companies don't even consider this. So last year, um, EY in the UK made this, this sort of load of this bomb uh, globally, and they said they're not, uh, if you want to apply for a job with EY, 
um, you don't necessarily have to have a degree. It's not a barrier to entry. Um, and it's just starting to, to, to reverberate like this um, because you're starting to see that a lot of companies, especially if you're looking at the future of making things, then it's not an academic degree because um, the, from that same article I, I, I quoted in the beginning, um, Aaron Dignan is saying your new companies, um, they, they, they are wanting makers, people who make things, experiment and do things versus people with credentials. Your credentials don't matter so much um, and for me in the future of creating those skills is taking short courses, a coding course, a UX course, a small quick course because the future of work, um, and this is from our visual, uh, hyper-visual presentation, um, this was quite, quite scary. Um, some of the things I'm not even sure what they mean, but I'll just rattle some of them off. So I understand UX and I understand coding. Um, there's an AR designer, so augmented reality designer, avatar programmer, embodied interaction designer, a fusionist, a uh, human organ designer, that I can understand, intelligent systems designer, sort of, interventionist, broad spectrum there, and real-time 3D designer. So what I want to just end off is on a video, if you are in the business of making things in the future and you're designing environments, this is quite possibly how your work, your daily work is going to look like. Ready. Should we start to panic? Not yet. Just bring the team in, please. I can see you're hard at work, Samir, but Penny needs your help. Yeah, sure thing. Just let me check out this bunker real quick. Samir, the client is on. As per usual, your sense of timing is just awesome. Kai san, Penny ga yonde imasu kedo. Imasu ni ukutte saite. It's coming. It's not. This is the flagship store. It's gotta be, it's gotta be unforgettable. Yeah. Not exactly blowing my hair back. Yeah, the space is driving me nuts. All right. How about a change of scenery? Welcome to Think Club. Some inspiration, please. Namaste. Impressive. That went well. And on that note, I'll leave you to contemplate the making of things in the future. Thank you very, very much, David.